the Black Pearl. A violent ringing of the bell awakened the concierge of number nine, Avenue Osh. She pulled the doorstring, grumbling. I thought everybody was in. It must be three o'clock. Perhaps it is someone for the doctor, muttered her husband. At that moment, a voice inquired, Dr. Arell, what floor? Third floor left, but the doctor won't go out at night. He must go tonight. The visitor entered the vestibule, ascended to the first floor, the second, the third, and without stopping at the doctor's door, he continued to the fifth floor. There he tried two keys. One of them fitted the lock. Ah, good, he murmured. That simplifies the business wonderfully. But before I commence work, I had better arrange for my retreat. Let me see. Have I had sufficient time to rouse the doctor and be dismissed by him? Not yet. A few minutes more. At the end of ten minutes, he descended the stairs, grumbling noisily about the doctor. The concierge opened the door for him and heard it click behind him. But the door did not lock, as the man had quickly inserted a piece of iron in the lock in such a manner that the bolt could not enter. Then, quietly, he entered the house again, unknown to the concierge. In case of alarm, his retreat was assured. Noiselessly, he ascended to the fifth floor once more. In the antechamber, by the light of his electric lantern, he placed his hat and overcoat on one of the chairs, took a seat on another, and covered his heavy shoes with felt slippers. Oof! Here I am, and how simple it was. I wonder why more people do not adopt the profitable and pleasant occupation of burglar. With a little care and reflection, it becomes a most delightful profession. Not too quiet and monotonous, of course, as it would then become wearisome. He unfolded a detailed plan of the apartment. Let me commence by locating myself. Here I see the vestibule in which I am sitting. On the street front, the drawing room, the boudoir, and dining room. Useless to waste any time there, as it appears that the Countess has a deplorable taste. Not a bibelot of any value. Now let's get down to business. Ah, here is a corridor. It must lead to the bedchambers. At a distance of three meters, I should come to the door of the wardrobe closet, which connects with the chamber of the Countess. He folded his plan, extinguished his lantern, and proceeded down the corridor, counting his distance thus. One meter, two meters, three meters. Here is the door. Mon Dieu, how easy it is. Only a small, simple bolt now separates me from the chamber, and I know that the bolt is located exactly one meter, 43 centimeters from the floor, so that thanks to a small incision I am about to make, I can soon get rid of the bolt. He drew from his pocket the necessary instruments. Then the following idea occurred to him. Suppose by chance the door is not bolted. I will try it first. He turned the knob and the door opened. My brave Lupin, surely fortune favors you. What's to be done now? You know the situation of the rooms. You know the place in which the Countess hides the Black Pearl. Therefore, in order to secure the Black Pearl, you have simply to be more silent than silence, more invisible than darkness itself. Arsène Lupin was employed fully a half hour in opening the second door, a glass door that led to the Countess's bedchamber. But he accomplished it with so much skill and precaution that even had the Countess been awake, she would not have heard the slightest sound. According to the plan of the rooms that he held, he had merely to pass around a reclining chair, which would bring him to an armchair, and beyond that, a small table close to the bed. On the table... There was a box of letter paper, and the black pearl was concealed in that box. He stooped and crept cautiously over the carpet, following the outlines of the reclining chair. When he reached the extremity of it, he stopped in order to repress the throbbing of his heart. Although he was not moved by any sense of fear, he found it impossible to overcome the nervous anxiety that one usually feels 
in the midst of profound silence. That circumstance astonished him because he had passed through many more solemn moments without the slightest trace of emotion. No danger threatened him. Then why did his heart throb like an alarm bell? Was it that sleeping woman who affected him? Was it the proximity of another pulsating heart? He listened and thought he could discern the rhythmical breathing of a person asleep. It gave him confidence like the presence of a friend. He sought and found the armchair, then by slow, cautious movements advanced toward the table, feeling ahead of him with outstretched arm. His right hand touched one of the feet of the table. Now he had simply to rise, take the pearl, and escape. That was fortunate, as his heart was leaping in his breast like a wild beast and made so much noise that he feared it would waken the countess. By a powerful effort of the will, he subdued the wild throbbing of his heart and was about to rise from the floor when his left hand encountered, lying on the floor, an object which he recognized as a candlestick, an overturned candlestick. A moment later, his hand encountered another object, a clock, one of those small traveling clocks covered with leather. Well, what had happened? He could not understand. That candlestick, that clock. Why were those articles not in their accustomed places? Ah, what had happened in the dread silence of the night? Suddenly a cry escaped him. He had touched, oh, some strange, unutterable thing. No, no, he thought. It cannot be. It is some fantasy of my excited brain. For twenty seconds, thirty seconds, he remained motionless, terrified, his forehead bathed with perspiration, and his fingers still retained the sensation of that dreadful contact. Making a desperate effort, he ventured to extend his arm again. Once more, his hand encountered that strange, unutterable thing. He must feel it and find out what it is. He found that it was hair, human hair, and a human face. And that face was cold, almost icy. However frightful the circumstances may be, a man like Arsène Lupin controls himself and commands the situation as soon as he learns what it is. So Arsène Lupin quickly brought his lantern into use. A woman was lying before him, covered with blood. Her neck and shoulders were covered with gaping wounds. He leaned over her and made a closer examination. She was dead. Dead. Dead, he repeated with a bewildered air. He stared at those fixed eyes, that grim mouth, that livid flesh, and that blood. All that blood which had flowed over the carpet and congealed there in thick black spots. He arose and turned on the electric lights. Then he beheld all the marks of a desperate struggle. The bed was in a state of great disorder. On the floor, the candlestick and the clock with the hands pointing to twenty minutes after eleven, then further away an overturned chair, and everywhere there was blood, spots of blood and pools of blood. And the black pearl, he murmured. The box of letter paper was in its place. He opened it eagerly. The jewel case was there, but it was empty. Vitre, he muttered. You boasted of your good fortune much too soon, my friend Lupin. With the countess lying cold and dead and the black pearl vanished, the situation is anything but pleasant. Get out of here as soon as you can or you may get into serious trouble. Yet he did not move. Get out of here? Oh, yes, of course. Any person would, except Arsène Lupin. He has something better to do. Now to proceed in an orderly way. At all events, you have a clear conscience. Let us suppose that you are the commissary of police and that you are proceeding to make an inquiry concerning this affair. Yes, but in order to do that, I require a clearer brain. Mine is muddled like a ragout. He tumbled into an armchair, 
with his clenched hands pressed against his burning forehead. The murder of the Avenue Osh is one of those which have recently surprised and puzzled the Parisian public. And certainly I should never have mentioned the affair if the veil of mystery had not been removed by Arsène Lupin himself. No one else knew the exact truth of the case. Who did not know? From having met her in the Bois, the fair Leontine Zalti, the once famous cantatrice, wife and widow of the Count d'Andio, the Zalti whose luxury dazzled all Paris some twenty years ago, the Zalti who acquired a European reputation for the magnificence of her diamonds and pearls, it was said that she wore upon her shoulders the capital of several banking houses and the gold mines of numerous Australian companies. Skillful jewelers worked for Zalti as they had formerly wrought for kings and queens. And who does not remember the catastrophe in which all that wealth was swallowed up? Of all that marvelous collection, nothing remained except the famous black pearl, the black pearl that is to say, a fortune, if she had wished to part with it. But she preferred to keep it, to live in a commonplace apartment with her companion, her cook, and a manservant, rather than sell that inestimable jewel. There was a reason for it, a reason she was not afraid to disclose. The black pearl was the gift of an emperor. Almost ruined and reduced to the most mediocre existence, she remained faithful to the companion of her happy and brilliant youth. The black pearl never left her possession. She wore it during the day, and at night concealed it in a place known to her alone. All these facts, being republished in the columns of the public press, served to stimulate curiosity. And strange to say, but quite obvious to those who have the key to the mystery, the arrest of the presumed assassin only complicated the question and prolonged the excitement. Two days later, the newspapers published the following item. Information has reached us of the arrest of Victor Danègre, the servant of the Countess d'Andio. The evidence against him is clear and convincing. On the silken sleeve of his liveried waistcoat, which Chief Detective Dudouis found in his garret between the mattresses of his bed, several spots of blood were discovered. In addition, a cloth-covered button was missing from that garment, and this button was found beneath the bed of the victim. It is supposed that after dinner, in place of going to his own room, Danègre slipped into the wardrobe closet and through the glass door had seen the Countess hide the precious black pearl. This is simply a theory, as yet unverified by any evidence. There is also another obscure point. At seven o'clock in the morning, Danègre went to the tobacco shop on the Boulevard de Courcelles. The concierge and the shopkeeper both affirm this fact. On the other hand, the Countess' companion and cook, who sleep at the end of the hall, both declare that when they arose at eight o'clock, the door of the antechamber and the door of the kitchen were locked. These two persons have been in the service of the Countess for twenty years and are above suspicion. The question is, how did de Negro leave the apartment? Did he have another key? These are matters that the police will investigate. As a matter of fact, the police investigation threw no light on the mystery. It was learned that Victor de Negro was a dangerous criminal, a drunkard, and a debauchee. But as they proceeded with the investigation, the mystery deepened and new complications arose. In the first place, a young woman, Mademoiselle de saint Clèves, the cousin and sole heiress of the Countess, declared that the Countess, a month before her death, had written a letter to her and in it described the manner in which the black pearl was concealed. The letter disappeared on the day after she received it. Who had stolen it? Again, the concierge related how she had opened the door for a person who had inquired for Dr. Arel. On being questioned, the doctor testified that no one had rung his bell. Then who was that person? An accomplice? 
The theory of an accomplice was thereupon adopted by the press and public, and also by Ganimard, the famous detective. Lupin is at the bottom of this affair, he said to the judge. Bah! exclaimed the judge. You have Lupin on the brain. You see him everywhere. Say rather that you see him every time you encounter something you cannot explain. Besides, you overlooked the fact that the crime was committed at 20 minutes past 11 in the evening, as is shown by the clerk, while the nocturnal visit, mentioned by the concierge, occurred at 3 o'clock in the morning. Officers of the law frequently form a hasty conviction as to the guilt of a suspected person, and then distort all subsequent discoveries to conform to their established theory. The deplorable antecedents of Victor de Negre, habitual criminal, drunkard, and rake, influenced the judge, and despite the fact that nothing new was discovered in corroboration of the early clues, his official opinion remained firm and unshaken. He closed his investigation, and a few weeks later, the trial commenced. It proved to be slow and tedious. The judge was listless, and the public prosecutor presented the case in a careless manner. Under those circumstances, de Negra's counsel had an easy task. He pointed out the defects and inconsistencies of the case for the prosecution, and argued that the evidence was quite insufficient to convict the accused. Who had made the key, the indispensable key without which de Negra, on leaving the apartment, could not have locked the door behind him? Who had ever seen such a key, and what had become of it? Who had seen the assassin's knife, and where is it now? In any event, argued the prisoner's counsel, the prosecution must prove, beyond any reasonable doubt, that the prisoner committed the murder. The prosecution must show that the mysterious individual who entered the house at three o'clock in the morning is not the guilty party. To be sure, the clock indicated eleven o'clock. But what of that? I contend that proves nothing. The assassin could turn the hands of the clock to any hour he pleased and thus deceive us in regard to the exact hour of the crime. Victor de Negre was acquitted. He left the prison on Friday about dusk, weak and depressed by his six months' imprisonment. The Inquisition, the solitude, the trial, the deliberations of the jury combined to fill him with a nervous fear. At night, he had been afflicted with terrible nightmares and haunted by weird visions of the scaffold. He was a mental and physical wreck. Under the assumed name of Anatole Dufour, he rented a small room on the heights of Montmartre and lived by doing odd jobs wherever he could find them. He led a pitiful existence. Three times he obtained regular employment, only to be recognized and then discharged. Sometimes he had an idea that men were following him, detectives, no doubt, who were seeking to trap and denounce him. He could almost feel the strong hand of the law clutching him by the collar. One evening, as he was eating his dinner at a neighboring restaurant, a man entered and took a seat at the same table. He was a person about 40 years of age and wore a frock coat of doubtful cleanliness. He ordered soup, vegetables, and a bottle of wine. After he had finished his soup, he turned his eyes on De Negra and gazed at him intently. De Negra winced. He was certain that this was one of the men who had been following him for several weeks. What did he want? De Negra tried to rise, but failed. His limbs refused to support him. The man poured himself a glass of wine and then filled De Negra's glass. The man raised his glass and said, To your health, Victor De Negra. Victor started in alarm and stammered, I? Uh, no, no, I swear to you. You will swear what? That you are not yourself? The servant of the Countess? What servant? My name is Dufour. Ask the proprietor. Yes. Anatole Dufour to the proprietor of this restaurant. But Victor de Negre to the officers of the law. That's not true. Someone has lied to you. The newcomer took a card from his pocket and handed it to Victor, who read on it, Rimaudan, ex-inspector of the detective force. 
private business transacted. Victor shuddered as he said, You are connected with the police? No, not now. But I have a liking for the business, and I continue to work at it in a manner more profitable. From time to time, I strike upon a golden opportunity, such as your case presents. My case? Yes, yours. I assure you it is a most promising affair, provided you are inclined to be reasonable. But if I am not reasonable? Oh, my good fellow, you are not in a position to refuse me anything I may ask. What is it you want? stammered Victor fearfully. Well, I will inform you in a few words. I am sent by Mademoiselle de saint Clèves, the heiress of the Countess d'Andio. What for? To recover the black pearl. Black pearl? That you stole. But I haven't got it. You have it. If I had, then I would be the assassin. You are the assassin. The Negre showed a forced smile. Fortunately for me, monsieur, the assize court was not of your opinion. The jury returned a unanimous verdict of acquittal. And when a man has a clear conscience and twelve good men in his favor, the ex-inspector seized him by the arm and said, No fine phrases, my boy. Now listen to me and weigh my words carefully. You will find they are worthy of your consideration. Now, de Neg, three weeks before the murder, you abstracted the cook's key to the servant's door and had a duplicate key made by a locksmith named Utar, 244 Rue Oberkamp. It's a lie. It's a lie, growled Victor. No person has seen that key. There is no such key. Here it is. After a silence, Grimaudan continued. You killed the countess with a knife purchased by you at the Bazaar de la République on the same day as you ordered the duplicate key. It has a triangular blade with a groove running from end to end. That is all nonsense. You are simply guessing at something you don't know. No one ever saw the knife. Here it is. Victor de Negre recoiled. The ex-inspector continued. There are some spots of rust upon it. Shall I tell you how they came there? Well, you have a key and a knife. Who can prove that they belong to me? The locksmith. And the clerk from whom you bought the knife. I have already refreshed their memories, and when you confront them, they cannot fail to recognize you. His speech was dry and hard, with a tone of firmness and precision. De Negre was trembling with fear, and yet he struggled desperately to maintain an air of indifference. Is that all the evidence you have? Oh, no, not at all. I have plenty more. For instance, after the crime, you went out the same way as you had entered. But in the center of the wardrobe room, being seized by some sudden fear... You leaned against the wall for support. How do you know that? No one could know such a thing, argued the desperate man. The police know nothing about it, of course. They never think of lighting a candle and examining the walls. But if they had done so, they would have found on the white plaster a faint red spot, quite distinct enough, however, to trace in it the imprint of your thumb, which you had pressed against the wall while it was wet with blood. Now, as you are well aware, under the Bertillon system, thumb marks are one of the principal means of identification. Victor de Negre was livid. Great drops of perspiration rolled down his face and fell upon the table. He gazed with a wild look at the strange man who had narrated the story of his crime as faithfully as if he had been an invisible witness to it. Overcome and powerless, Victor bowed his head. He felt that it was useless to struggle against this marvelous man. So, he said, How much will you give me if I give you the pearl? Nothing. Ah, oh, you are joking. Or do you mean that I should give you an article worth thousands and hundreds of thousands and get nothing in return? You will get your life. Is that nothing? The unfortunate man shuddered. And Grimaudan added in a milder tone, 
Come, Danego, that pearl has no value in your hands. It is quite impossible for you to sell it. So what is the use of your keeping it? There are pawnbrokers, and someday I will be able to get something for it. But that day may be too late. Why? Because by that time you may be in the hands of the police, and with the evidence that I can furnish, the knife, the key, the thumb mark, what will become of you? Victor rested his head on his hands and reflected. He felt that he was lost, irremediably lost, and at the same time a sense of weariness and depression overcame him. He murmured faintly, When must I give it to you? Tonight, within an hour. If I refuse? If you refuse, I shall post this letter to the Procureur of the Republic, in which letter Mademoiselle de saint Clair denounces you as the assassin. Danègre poured out two glasses of wine, which he drank in rapid succession. Then, rising, said, Pay the bill and let us go. I have had enough of the cursed affair. Night had fallen. The two men walked down the Rue Le Pic and followed the exterior boulevards in the direction of the Place de l'Etoile. They pursued their way in silence. Victor had a stooping carriage and a dejected face. When they reached the Parc Monceau, he said, We are near the house. Parbleu, you only left the house once before your arrest, and that was to go to the tobacco shop. Here it is, said de Negre in a dull voice. They passed along the garden wall of the Countess house and crossed a street on a corner of which stood the tobacco shop. A few steps farther on, de Negre stopped. His limbs shook beneath him, and he sank to a bench. Well, what now? demanded his companion. It is there. Where? Come now, no nonsense. There, in front of us. Where? Between two paving stones. Which? Look for it. Which stones? Victor made no reply. Ah, I see, exclaimed Grimaudin. You want me to pay for the information. No, but I am afraid I will starve to death. So that is why you hesitate. Well, I'll not be hard on you. How much do you want? Enough to buy a steerage passage to America. All right. And a hundred francs to keep me until I get work there. You shall have two hundred. Now speak. Count the paving stones to the right from the sewer hole. The pearl is between the twelfth and thirteenth. In the gutter? Yes, close to the sidewalk. Grimaudan glanced around to see if anyone were looking. Some tram cars and pedestrians were passing. But bah, they will not suspect anything. He opened his pocket knife and thrust it between the twelfth and thirteenth stones. And if it is not there, he said to Victor. be there, unless someone saw me stoop down and hide it. Could it be possible that the black pearl had been cast into the mud and filth of the gutter to be picked up by the first comer? The black pearl, a fortune. How far is it down, he asked. About ten centimeters. He dug up the wet earth. The point of his knife struck something. He enlarged the hole with his finger. Then he abstracted the black pearl from its filthy hiding place. Good. Here are your two hundred francs. I will send you the ticket for America. On the following day, this article was published in the Echo de France, 
and was copied by the leading papers throughout the world. Yesterday, the famous Black Pearl came into the possession of Arsène Lupin, who recovered it from the murderer of the Countess d'Andio. In a short time, facsimiles of that precious jewel will be exhibited in London, St. Petersburg, Calcutta, Buenos Aires, and New York. Arsène Lupin will be pleased to consider all propositions submitted to him through his agents. And that is how crime is always punished and virtue rewarded, said Arsène Lupin, after he had told me the foregoing history of the Black Pearl. And that is how you, under the assumed name of Grimaudan, ex-inspector of detectives, were chosen by fate to deprive the criminal of the benefit of his crime. Exactly. And I confess that the affair gives me infinite satisfaction and pride. The forty minutes that I passed in the apartment of the Countess d'Andio after learning of her death were the most thrilling and absorbing moments of my life. In those forty minutes, involved as I was in a most dangerous plight, I calmly studied the scene of the murder and reached the conclusion that the crime must have been committed by one of the house servants. I also decided that in order to get the pearl, that servant must be arrested, and so I left the waistcoat button. It was necessary also for me to hold some convincing evidence of his guilt, so I carried away the knife which I found upon the floor and the key which I found in the lock. I closed and locked the door and erased the finger marks from the plaster in the wardrobe closet. In my opinion, that was one of those flashes of genius, I said, interrupting. Of genius, if you wish. But I flatter myself it would not have occurred to the average mortal. To frame, instantly, the two elements of the problem, an arrest and an acquittal. To make use of the formidable machinery of the law to crush and humble my victim and reduce him to a condition in which, when free, he would be certain to fall into the trap I was laying for him. Poor devil. Poor devil, do you say? Victor de Negre, the assassin? He might have descended to the lowest depths of vice and crime if he had retained the black pearl. Now he lives. Think of that. Victor de Negre is alive. And you have the black pearl. He took it out of one of the secret pockets of his wallet, examined it, gazed at it tenderly, and caressed it with loving fingers and sighed as he said, What cold Russian prince, what vain and foolish Raja may some day possess this priceless treasure? Or perhaps some American millionaire is destined to become the owner of this morsel of exquisite beauty that once adorned the fair bosom of Leontine Zalti, the Countess Dandio.